So we lean in today and we start asking questions about the favorite. We have to take a look at what goes on in the life of Joseph and how does the gospel, how does the scriptures continue to tell the story of God and our story even today. Here's what I know. There's a lot in this video that that leads to the whole first part of the trilogy, but today we're really just leaning in on Joseph and his, his family dynamic, being the favorite. I need you to help me out here. Is anybody here in a family that you feel had a favorite? Come on, help me out. Okay, I'm not going to make you name names, but it seems like you were pretty, even like most of you didn't have a favorite, but um, there's, there's families with favoritism. I was reading a story of a young man who, uh, his brother was 15, his grandparents had always doted on him, and they bought him a brand new truck before he even had a license. He lived in Hawaii, and they even bought seat heaters. So like his younger brother's like, man, you're getting everything, right? They bought him his first year of gas. Like, everything was really good. They even paid for driving school. When this young man, his younger brother, came of the age to drive, he was thinking, you know, I know I'm not the favorite, but, but, you know, it won't be a new truck, but I'll get something pretty good, right? Grandma and Grandpa poured it out for him. What am I going to get? His grandma got him a hemp bracelet from a garage sale. Oh, right? Somebody who's not the favorite is like, preach all day. You know, like, that. that's brutal, that's brutal. There's always these weird dynamics. We talked about it late last week with Rachel and Leah in the Bible. Rachel was pretty. Leah was meh. And, um, and you know, it just, there's even stories like this one sister who uh, had always been less attractive than her older sister. And uh, it was always just kind of known and treated pretty normally. And when her older sister began having children, her first daughter was absolutely stunning. This beautiful little ringlets and bright-eyed girl. And then... There's the little sister, and uh, she's, she's born, and the grandmother says, I certainly hope she grows into her face. I would hate for her to, you know, grow up under her shadow with such a pretty big sister and, and kind of look like that. And the, the girl who's these little children's aunt goes, you mean like me? And she's like, exactly. Can you imagine your mom saying, yes, you're the uglier one? Right? Yeah, favoritism hurts. And you go, this isn't really right. This isn't how it should go. There's a a good picture of favoritism here. It even works in nature, (laughs) right? There it is. Somebody's like, I'm the bird on the bottom. I'm mom's footstool, right? She's giving that thing a whole cricket. The other brother's like, it's okay. You can stand on my face right? That's how favoritism feels in this world. We're going to lean in today and we're going to talk about it and we're going to understand that the story of Joseph isn't very different than this. So what we'll do is we'll lean in, we're going to read the text, I'm going to stop a couple times and talk about some things. Uh, um, Genesis 37, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob or Israel's family, his family line. Joseph A young man of 17 was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Uh, I went into it last week. His father's wives. Remember, really messed up family system. Two wives who were sisters and then their servants are the moms of all these kids. And he, Joseph, brought their father a bad report about them. He was a narc. Joseph came back and told on his big brothers. He was the one who ratted out his big brothers, which always brings about such loyalty from the older siblings. Um, I remember as a young man, my brother took a baseball bat and a golf ball, perfect combination, unless you're in a neighborhood like we were. He threw it up and he just torched a ball and he hit it. He was like, whack! And it hit on the pavement out about, I don't know, 100 feet ahead of us, and it just kicked up in the air. And we were like, oh. And then my, ma- my mind, not real mathematical, but it did geometry. I'm like, oh. And then right through a double pane glass window. And we're like, should we go inside, have a snack? Good enough. And we go in, because our neighbor now had a looking port in his, in his front window. And um, we were, we're, you know, you're just, you're plotting your doom all day. You're like, oh, we're in so much trouble. And then we hear the dum, dum, dum on our front door. My mom's like, I wonder who could be here. And we're like, yeah, yeah, totally. It's weird. And uh, I'm like, I'm going to go outside and pick up dog poop, you know, do anything to get out of the house. And um, and the door opens and we hear, your sons broke my window. And my mom said, give me the ball. I'll call you back. Whack. And close the door. This wasn't her first rodeo with us. And um, she stands us up and she's like, did you guys break the window? 
I'm, I'm weak. I am just weak with this. I, I can't stand it. My brother's like, what? No. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's the way we're going. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird, you know. My brother begins constructing the facade that would hold no weight because the weakest link in the chain was standing next to him and going. I just, and my mom dialed in like, I'm going to break this one. She's like, did you break the window? And finally I'm like, I can't lie. He did it. He did it. That story's not funny to him. He'll watch this online and be like, that little jerk. Like he still, I think he wants to beat me up still for it because I just remember him being like, dude. And of course, he spent much time in his room thinking about his actions. It was awesome. But I was not the beloved little brother in that case because I had told on him and it cost him dearly. Hear this again. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And he told their dad about a bad report of them. The love is building. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because Joseph was born to him in his old age. He made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So a couple of things. This robe would have been um, like wearing a $1,000 or $2,000 Armani suit to a construction site. You don't plan on that guy strapping the tool bags on and doing any work. When Joseph got that robe, it said, let them do the work. You're the favorite. They hated him for it. They could see that their father, it says in the text, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, like, have you, and help me out here. Have you ever wondered if you weren't the favorite in your family? Anybody? Trust me, at, a, at some point you all were the unfavorite. I mean, everybody goes through it. But you may have, Ethan, put your hand down. Um, <laughs> but, but you go through seasons where you wonder, like, you know, oh, these guys, not only do they know their father doesn't love them, but it's recorded in the Bible for all time that they were less loved. It's a little harsh, but it very clearly points out that the favoritism is painfully clear to the ones who are loved less. But ironically, it's not that clear to Joseph, I don't think. I don't think he can see he's not wise enough yet to understand that what he is receiving from his father is painful to his older brothers. The scriptures go on. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. I I love that. I love that he just comes out. He's like, man, I had a dream. Check this out. This goes so poorly to him. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf stood and rose, uh, rose and stood upright while all of your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Oh, you'd be good with that if your little brother said that to you? You'd be like, I'm about to kick you in your sheave, right? You would not deal well with that. You guys sit there all patiently like, amen, yeah. No, you wouldn't be okay with that. So his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told his brothers, oh, listen, he said, like, oh, Hear ye, hear ye, I have another great bit of news for you. I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, uh, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and he said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I actually, and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him. But his, father's, his father kept this matter in mind. What we have to understand is there's something, there's something brewing under this text. There's something going on, and it speaks directly into our lives. And it's going to feel a bit like being spiritually exfoliated today. We're going to take off the top layer, and it's important that we do. It's important that Christians do this work because this text tells us that we should be careful of the things that grow in the dark. We should be careful about the things that grow in dark places. Help me out here. What grows in the dark? 
Come on. Help me out. Mushrooms. Mushrooms grow in the dark, which can be delicious or very deadly. Uh, who knows? So um, roll the dice. Help me back there. Your hands up. Monsters under the bed. They, they, they don't. You're, you've been tricked. All right. Uh, don't listen to your older brother. Um, so you have mold. Mold grows in the dark, right? It grows in the dark. You've got mold. You've got fungus. You have all these different things that grow in darkness, they grow in the darkness, and they're kind of unseen, and you think it's no big deal, but they're actually toxic when things begin to grow in the dark. And when things grow in the dark, well, quite honestly, mushrooms, a very tiny select amount of fungus that grows in the dark can be eaten. Most of it is lethal to ingest. Most of it's lethal. What grows in the dark generally isn't for life in the light. What grows in the dark is usually toxic to that life in the light. What grows in the sunlight? You have vegetables, fruits, trees, everything. Everything grows in the light. And we have to wonder, well, let's look at it from the text. Verse 4, they hated him. They hated Joseph. But I don't know that it was outwardly visible. It may have just started right here. It may have just been a small, dark place of was like, man, I am sick of that little runt getting all the good stuff. And it starts with a thought, and then it breeds to a conversation among the brothers, and they hated him. They hated him deeply. Now, as a little brother who often uh, worked situations to my favor, I would get my older brother in trouble a lot. It was awesome. And um, I remember one time I got him in trouble when we had company over, which was always the crown jewel of achievement in my mind. And, um, and he got sent to bed at like 8 p.m. Oh, it was the best. He goes up, he goes to bed, and I walk by his room later that night into the inky darkness of Lincoln's room, whom I love dearly and would never do this had I known I was gonna grow up. Um, but, but into the inky darkness, I heard out of his room, I hate you. <laughs> hey, man. And I just kind of scurried off to my room. But I could feel it. He didn't hate me, but he was so sick of me kind of ratting him out and getting him in trouble. There was this moment where, like, you could kind of feel it. I was like, I just don't think he prefers me, you know? But deep down, I think he wanted to put a beating on me. The same for Joseph's brothers. It says in Scripture, they hated him. Then it says in verse 5, they hated him all the more. By verse 8, it's just repeating the same line. They hated him even more. What's that saying? It's growing. It's multiplying. What's growing in the dark is going to spill out into the daylight. See, Joseph had brought about his father. His father, um, he got his like precious affection. But from his brothers, he was giving himself. He was piling on this hatred because he wasn't aware of what that was doing to them and they hated him in, his, in their hearts and they wanted to punish him and they wanted an exact, they wanted to exact some sort of vengeance for what was going on. And it matters to you and I because hate controls your senses. If you notice in the text, what it says is Joseph said, guys, I had a dream. We were binding sheaves of grain. Mine stood up and yours bowed down. He didn't really tell them the meaning of the dream, but what they do, they assumed the worst. They assumed the worst of their brother. And they're like, so, we're going to worship you and bow down? They had no question of what it meant. They just knew, based on past experience and a lot of assumption, that what he was about to do was going to be painful for them, and they became very angry. They hated him more, and they hated him more. And what was growing in the darkness in their heart would spill over into their everyday family lives. And what we have to understand in the church is it's no different for us today than it was for Joseph. We have been, quite often, people who experienced favoritism in negative ways. Usually there's only one favorite, and then there's the rest of us, the masses, who see the favoritism and we get frustrated. And I think it's important to note that when we look at somebody and we think, why do they get every privilege? Privilege? Why do they have everything? Why is everything going well in their life and not in mine? I hate that they have it better than me. Or I hate that that person didn't help me. I hate my dad for playing favorites. I hate my mom for preferring my other sister. I hate, and it just starts this little thing inside of us. And what happens is the darkness isn't static. It's a dynamic reality. It grows. 
If there's a little darkness inside of you, it's not going to be like, yeah, we're good enough with this corner. It's going to seek to expand into all of your life. Think of mold. You don't find a spot of mold and go, oh, awesome. Well, that's all. I mean, it's just a little piece of mold, right? You can come back to that a month later. It looks like a sheep crawled in there. It grows, doesn't it? You're like, oh, wow. That thing looks like it has a hand. Did it wave at me? It's huge. It doesn't stay static. And what we need to understand is Joseph's brothers had their senses skewed by their own hurt. Favoritism hurts. You and I have been hurt by favoritism because everybody in this room has been on the bottom of the pile in something. Everybody loses at something. So we've all felt it, and you begin, if you began to hate people for it, it begins to control your senses. You see them, you automatically assume the worst. Have you ever had somebody you don't like, and they drive by you, and they're like, what are you doing on my street? I bet you're out to get me, you jerk. And they're like, I was going to Burger King. Burger King. They don't even know you hate them. They don't even probably have no idea how much you feel. But what we have to do is look at Joseph's brothers teach us a lesson. Hate consumes us. Hate owns us. Scripture in 1 John 2.11 actually tells us the, the enormity of hatred in our own hearts. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. We get blinded to anything good someone might do because they may have hurt us years ago because they were the favorite or they were favored or someone didn't show you any kind of attention when you felt you deserved it and worked hard for it. We can get blinded and we can assume the worst of the world around us and we can hate people quietly in our hearts for a little while and everybody thinks it's normal, but eventually it comes roaring out of our life, generally in the form of slander, gossip, and in its worst means, violence and different things like that. We can't pretend that hatred is not an issue in the church because if we did a quiet poll in here today, every one of us has a name. Every one of us has a face of someone who has wronged us, and we feel an inkling of hatred. And I want to tell you that inkling must be dealt with. You could feel a world of hatred, and equally so, that needs to be dealt with. That needs to be dealt with in your life, because we have to understand we are actually growing here. We're in a dynamic living reality. We're growing. So the question is, what are you growing? What are you cultivating? What kind of life are you growing Remember, if there is that darkness of hatred in any corner of your heart, all it'll do is expand. It'll do its best to own you. I don't know about you, but the brothers in this story get my compassion quite often. Can you imagine being so desperately disliked by your dad that he's willing to throw in your face the goodness of your little brother? He had the better mom. Rachel was Joseph's mom. And so Jacob just loved him more. That's brutal. That's brutal. It's unfair. The brothers didn't have a perfect life. The family system was broken. Remember, Jacob was married to Leah and Rachel, sisters, and they gave him their servants to see who could give him the most children. It's really messed up. It's really messed up, and it says God redeems broken systems, but it also tells us these brothers were in a broken place. Their heart was broken. They were ashamed. They were lesser than, and they hated it. Jacob knew better than to play favorites. Jacob knew better. He knew the cost of having favorites. I mean, if you study the story of Jacob's parents, Rebekah and Isaac, and the war between Jacob and Esau, his brother, he knew better. He knew the outcome of this. But here's the reality. Even legitimate reasons should not become excuses to allow hatred in the heart of a Christian. Here's why. Because it takes over. It takes over. It's so easy to hate because you just hide it in a quiet little dark space and it just takes off growing on its own. We can be wronged for anything. So I want to say something today. Go back if you would. Um, Legitimate reasons. If you've been verbally abused, physically abused, harmed, it's a legitimate reason to be hurt, and it's wrong. But here's the reality. It can't be the thing that allows you to hate. So when I say forgive people, I'm not saying give them freedom to come back and hurt you again. I'm saying forgive them and cut them free from your life. 
Cut them free to drift off into their own obscurity, but don't hold on to them and hate them because it does, does them no harm and it does you terrible harm. One of the punishments in the ancient Roman Empire was to take the body of the person you killed and tie you wrist to wrist, neck to neck, and face to face. And you would walk with the cadaver you killed in front of you and what happened? It transferred its diseases and death to you. It was a slow and brutal execution. That's hatred. You are tying yourself face to face with the very thing you hate. The problem is it doesn't hurt the person you hate. It only hurts you. The cost for unforgiveness and hatred being allowed to live is devastating to the person who hosts it. The person who hosts, harbors, is a host to hatred is the person who pays the ultimate price. But legitimate reasons should never be an excuse to say, I'm allowed to hate them. We're never allowed to hate them, but we must learn to forgive, and the only way we can forgive is in the way Christ did. At great expense to ourselves, we forgive people, but then we as Christians live by the power of the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit time after time to help us learn to forgive. Help me learn what it is to forgive those who've wronged me. Help me to forgive legitimate reasons Legitimate abuses, things that should have never been said to a child or an adult, legitimate shame poured on you at any point in life where you feel like you've been shamed and ostracized. Legitimate reasons can never be good excuses for hatred. We must deal with the hatred and recognize to hold on to it is to kill ourselves spiritually. We quit growing. Well, if you hold on to hatred, it expands and grows, which means what? that the Holy Spirit in your life, by your choice, is not transforming you into the image of Jesus. You're growing either into the image of Jesus or into the image of that which you hate. The choice is quite clear. It's just the discipline of how do we cultivate something different. We have to first recognize there's no legitimate reason to hate. But there is a legitimate reason to forgive and let them go and never let them back into your life again or to put up boundaries that don't allow abuse to take place. But the reality for us is these things can't feed the inner beast inside of us. The next thing we understand is we have to ask a question. Has hatred caused you to live in darkness? Has it caused you to live in darkness? I know there's some of you sitting out there today going, oh, please don't say my name. How does he know? I don't know. I know because I've been in the darkness. I've struggled with it. I have struggled before because someone, there have been pe- teachers, coaches, friends, a myriad of people, mentors who've shamed me. Whether they meant to or not, I don't know. I just know that hatred took over like that. And it wasn't until I got into the posture where I was like, fine, and I quit worrying about myself and my ego and what was right and what was wrong. And I remember just laying it down before God and not caring who was right anymore, not caring who was wrong, and just saying, God, help me forgive them. Help me forgive and just let them go. I never want to see them again, if I'm honest, but I don't want to be bound to this because I knew hatred had caused me to live in a darkness I couldn't live in. And to be real honest, it felt more like being gutted like a deer than it did hugged by my grandmother, but it really cleaned me out. It cleaned out of me the darkness, and it was only the Spirit of God. It was painful. I felt ashamed at times. There were times I told Erica, I don't even want to grocery shop in Zealand. I feel like everybody knows that I'm a doorknob or I'm a loser. Nobody knew, nobody cared. But I was living in my own darkness until God cleaned me out. I invite you to that process because if we don't ask questions like these, we begin to grow toxic things. And what we're called to is to live in the light of Christ. They say sunlight's the best disinfectant. The light of Christ can kill the hatred in your heart. It can allow forgiveness to begin. And we must understand we are called to live in that rhythm, in that hope. We have to understand that it is death to us. We are bound to what we hate unless we forgive and let go and walk away. We are bound to it. So what we must do is understand that to live in Christ is to live under the light of his Holy Spirit and invite the Holy Spirit to shine in us the areas of darkness where we hold on just to a little bit of hate, just a little bit of hate. 
You know, it won't hurt anybody. It's just right here because that person deserves it. That thing's going to grow in the dark. And what we have to do is understand our life lives under the scope of Scripture. We live under the power of the Holy Spirit, and we invite the Lord to speak to us and to shine a light inside of us towards that which we hate because we know for sure that there will always be favorites in this world. There will be people who seem they're like cats. They always land on their feet. And you're like, justice for you, sir. You want them to finally land on their face, right? There will always be favorites. There will always be someone smarter, always be someone prettier, always be someone more athletic, who can sing better, who can do everything better, and they like get an honorary doctorate degree given to them. And you're like, oh, I went to school for nine years for a bachelor's degree. What is happening? And you feel frustrated. That will always be there. There will always be someone to hate. Satan loves to use hate to distract us from the love of Christ. We have to live in the light of the Holy Spirit and say, look at me, search me, O God, and show me if there's any wicked way inside of me. Reveal it to me. You must choose to be in the light of Christ, which is to live as Christ and forgive freely as you were forgiven. Forgive freely as you were forgiven. So you ask, Eric, how do I do it? How do I do this? How do I live this out? When you're passed up for the job you earned because somebody else's like nephew got it and you're like, (laughs) you know, he can't even tie his shoes and you're super angry about it and you're losing your mind, instead of stewing on it, release them to God and speak it out immediately. God, I want to hate him, but I I forgive him. I forgive. Don't stew and let it grow. Trust in the character of God rather than in the plight of your circumstances. Trust in the character of God and get back into the light. When we trust in God's character, we remember that he has for us a love that is undying, that indeed you are his favorite. He adores you. He died for you. While you were yet sinners, Christ hung on the cross for us. The hope of our faith is that he loves us. He has a plan for us, and it goes far beyond our circumstantial frustrations with favoritism and hurt. Ours is a single calling, to love God in the way we love this world, to love and know God by forgiving as freely as we were forgiven. It's not easy, but we can trust that God does indeed have a plan for you. He who put the world in orbit and everything around it going into into this perfect balance also has a plan for your life. And it must start with us being willing to forgive and not let the darkness and hatred fester. That hope comes only in the name of Jesus because that's where our salvation and our purpose begin. Lord Jesus Christ, as your church, we turn our hearts towards you and we recognize that the life of Joseph was a life that um, was hated by his brothers. And we recognize, God, that his brother's hatred is often something we've felt, we've experienced, and we've leaned into. So God, today, we just pause to lay it out before you that we needed forgiveness It's not just someone else who needed grace. We did, God. And we ask that you would help us see ourselves in light of your sacrifice for us. Help us to see that our lives are rooted in forgiveness, a forgiveness that was first given so that we could freely forgive. So Lord Jesus, today, there's a bunch of names running through the minds of people in this room who've wronged them. There's a bunch of names and faces, but today we cling to one name, to your great name, the name of the one who loved us from the very foundation of the world and redeemed us by his own blood. Today we cling to the name of Christ, and we ask, Jesus, if you would help us to learn the art of forgiveness, the slow and intentional effort to forgive those who've wronged us, that we may be free and learn to live in the light of Christ. May the darkness not exist within us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to um, invite you to a posture that um, is transformative.
Um, you've heard the kind of younger brother I was, and I have been blessed by my brother and our friendship, and, uh, and I've asked him to forgive me for some of the things, and he, he joyfully did. And, and it means a lot to know when you're restored, when you willfully broke things. But, um, but the church has a posture that I think is important. And it's one of those things where we choose when things hurt us, we grab them and we hold them close. And we're going to always remember, but here we do this. And I invite you this week to do this. I invite you to take the person, the name, the event, the series of things that happen, and just hold it in your hands and do this. God, I don't want it anymore. I don't want to hate anymore. Or maybe I want to hate, but I need you to take it. I want you to give back to him what he died to redeem. Give back to God the very things he died to redeem us from. Today, spend some time. It won't take you long. Just ask, Holy Spirit, will will you shine a light in my life and show me if I hate anybody? Oh, there they are. You know, it'll happen pretty quick. Read Psalm 51. See what confession's like. And spend some time like this. Hold up to God everything that seeks to grow darkness in you and give it back to him. Just give it back to him and see if the light of Christ doesn't come roaring in. And you're not free from that cadaver of a memory that seeks to ruin you. And you're not, you will be called into the purposeful life in Christ presently. Forgiveness is not optional in the Christian life. So I invite you today to hold up that which broke you, and give it back to the one who died on your behalf. It's not yours to bear. It's not yours to bear. It's not an easy calling, but it's a transformative calling. When we say no more to the darkness of hatred, we say yes to the coming of the Holy Spirit. We invite the Holy Spirit to live in us. Invite the light in. Invite the Spirit to fill you and displace the darkness. And as you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, it's time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed.